Hello and welcome to On Thriving, the podcast that empowers change makers ready to unlock their full potential to thrive and make a positive impact on the world. Before we dive into the episode, I want to remind you that you can support the podcast by subscribing, rating, and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform, and by subscribing and hitting the bell for notifications on YouTube. Your feedback and all of these actions help us reach more people and continue to produce high quality content. Also, if you're interested in learning more about astrology, you can download my free guide called A Guide to Saturn and Pisces from my website at taylorshuler.com. And finally, I am thrilled to announce the launch of my new monthly membership community called Thrive. This community is designed to help you grow, connect with me and other like-minded people to learn, network, and collaborate, and get exclusive access to an extensive library of resources and tools that will help you live your best life and make the world a better place. I'm also offering private text and video chat to a limited number of members in the Societe Lu Noir part of the community. You can learn more about the community and join us on my website, taylorshuler.com slash thrive. Hi there, and welcome back to this episode of On Thriving. Today, I am joined by astrologer and friend Tara All, and I'm just so excited. She is the author of Astrology by Moonlight, and Tara is an evolutionary astrologer, writer, artist, and tarot reader. She's the co-author of Astrology by Moonlight and Natural Astrology. Tara sees clients, teaches, and speaks, including at NORWAC, the Northwest Astrology Conference, UAC, which I think is the United Astrology Conference, and ESAR, the International Society for Astrological Research. She's currently the resident astrologer and marketing manager for Sage Goddess and the ESAR vice president, or ISAR. Some people, I, I say ESAR, but people say ISAR. Uh, you can connect with her at www.taraall, which is T-A-R-A-A-A-L.com. So welcome, Tara. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Taylor. It's so good to be here with you. I say ESAR as well, by the way. So okay. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Team ESAR yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and thank you for your service with ESAR. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And um, and the com I'm grateful. I'm sure the community is grateful for, for your service there too. It's not easy, you know. No, but that's also how you and I got to know each other. So it's an extra benefit to do ESAR things because you meet amazing people. Yeah. Absolutely. I know. It was so fun meeting you mm -hmm. at ESAR in Denver, Colorado this past, was it August? August, I think. Yeah. 22. Oh my gosh. Time just flies. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I'm I'm very grateful for that. And all the folks that we met, it was just so magical to have like a few, almost what, 700 astrologers in one place at one time big. for a couple of days. You just feel the magic, like the energy in the air is electric, yeah. right? Yeah. It was so, great. Yeah. So we're here today to talk about the new moon in Taurus and the preceding couple of weeks uh, until we have that full moon that's going to be in Gemini. And so I guess we can we can kind of dive right in. Yeah. All right. So I will uh, share the chart to start just so folks can see what we're talking about. So we've got the new moon in Taurus happening at 28 degrees and 25 minutes of Taurus. What's a good place for us to start? What's well, the first thing that you look at? What's the first thing you look at when you look at a lunation? I don't know if I have a one way of doing things. You and I were just talking about being kind of spontaneous and and uh so I don't have a prescription. Yeah. But this this one in particular for whatever reason, and it makes sense because it's Taurus and it's an earth sign and linked with the body. But I feel there's a big opportunity for a new relationship with our bodies. And I think there's a lot to do with the body intelligence, right? Taurus is so much about those animal instincts. I've been listening to both Colin Bedell, I think, talk about this recently, and other people too, about how Taurus is so good at making decisions, right? And so I've been thinking into that about how you know, let's just play with Capricorn and Taurus for a second. So I just bear with me as we kind of run. It feels off stream, but we'll bring it back into, <laughs> into the ocean here. Um, Stephen Forrest mentions how 
Capricorn will climb kind of any mountain, right? You give it a task, like it's going to do it, but it doesn't always choose the best thing, the thing that has the most value. So sometimes you end up, oh, at the top of this mountaintop and, you know, yeah, I'm doing the thing and you realize you don't want to be there anyway. In the earth signs, it's Taurus that has so much to do with knowing the thing that has value, meaning, and purpose. So that's kind of my first, I guess, feeling into this lunation is what does have value, meaning, and purpose. And how do you, how do you feel into that? Right. Because Taurus is a feeling sensual sign. It's not about over intellectualizing things. Mm, yeah. I just want to say that again. So, what has value, meaning, and purpose? Yeah. And so, it's about this new moon is starting something new and it's about starting something and reevaluating what has value, meaning, and purpose. That is yeah. so profound. I mean, like, like it sounds like a fast thing to say, but if you really mm. think that, I mean, and that I feel like is the slowness that you feel with Taurus, right? It's like, yeah. okay, let's like slow that down and say it again. And Mercury just station retrograde at the time that we're recording this. So I feel like my brain is like, let's slow that down and then like feel into the fixedness, you know, energy. There. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Oh, you mean, and and I, I really can see that with Venus ruling Taurus and that's value. Um. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about like the meaning and purpose though. So the, where the value, meaning and purpose comes is actually in my, my first teacher for years was Laura Nelbandian and she, you know, owner of Norwalk as maybe most of you know her. And so that was my, my, really my introduction into like deep dive into astrology. And she would always say that all the fixed signs want v value, meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. It's just in a different area, you know, of life. And so that has really stuck with me. And of course, with Taurus, the value, meaning, and purpose, you can look at it in your material stuff. But Taurus is also about self-worth, self-value, self, self-love, self right? And resources just in general, but you are your number one resource. But back to your question, I just had to say that just in case anyone thinks like, it's not mine. You know, I just picked it up and carried along, along with most of the stuff I feel like I do. But yeah, the meaning and purpose. Thick signs don't, you know, they don't want to do things just to do them. Right. And in some ways, they're all about proving or showing the value, meaning, and purpose of whatever was initiated in the cardinal sign prior. So let's just stick with the Taurus theme to make it easy. So what, what do we initiate with Aries, the sign that comes before Taurus? Right. It is, it is myself. I put myself out there in the world. Right. It's my, it's to some extent my self image. I'm alive. I'm a person. Right. Yeah. So Taurus wants to bring value, meaning, and purpose to that. How do I show that that self? that I have birth into the world has value, has meaning and has purpose. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. And so the other thing is that this new moon is going to be happening at 28 degrees in 25 minutes, which is what we refer to as anoretic, which basically means it's in the last three degrees of a sign. Every zodiac mm -hmm. sign is 30 degrees. And once you get to like, I'd even say late 26, but 27, 28, yeah. 29, it's like, yeah. We're wrapping something up. So I'm curious your thoughts on mm. how you interpret a new moon, which is like a new beginning when it's almost at the end. It's like you're beginning at the end. Do you see it like that or do you see it differently? No, I, I, I those are good words you put around it. I, I think, again, it comes back to that, a new relationship with the thing you've already been doing for a long time. Right. And so maybe that feels subtle, but you know how it is when, when you've been sort of doing something forever, maybe for years, and all of a sudden you just see it a little bit differently or your relationship with it is just a little bit different. And now all of a sudden you see it all in a new light, but it's not really new. That's, I guess that's my best way to try to, <laughs> to give some, give some words around what, how that feels to me. Yeah. And I think it's, um, it's also kind of fitting in a way, because when you're beginning at the end, when you've been doing something for a really long time and you're kind of starting again, the new moon doesn't have a lot of light. It doesn't have enough, mm -hmm. a lot of energy. And when you get to the end of something, I feel like you also don't have a lot of energy. Yeah. Right? Yep. And, um, and so I want to just share the chart again, because I just want to look at the aspects that we've got going on here. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the new moon is sextile to Mars at 29 degrees of Cancer, another anoretic degree. And it's also trine. It's an out of sign trine, but it's trying to Pluto at zero degrees of, Quir of Aquarius, which is stationed retrograde by this point in time. And we also see a T square in this chart between, um, it's actually a grand cross. You can't see the south node, mm. but we'll yeah. see 
here, just the T-square highlighted of Mars opposite Pluto and then square the nodes. And so uh, what I interpret this as when you have the sextile and trine with the opposition and then you have this T-square, it means that this new moon is helping us to negotiate mm -hmm. the energy here of the the sort of opposition <clears throat> between Mars and Pluto. And um, we, we can get into what that means, but I think uh, the one thing I just want to say is it's very fitting to have a new beginning at the ending when we're looking at Pluto retrograde going back into mm -hmm. Capricorn, right? Because um, Pluto's been in Capricorn since 2008. It will come back into in Aquarius. But I was just um, rereading... Uh, Lee Lehman's book, um, The Astrology of Sustainability. Mm. And in this book, she goes through the Pluto cycles. And then she talks about the outer planet cycles that are, are sort of like part of the Pluto uh, uh, transits through a sign because Pluto takes a really long time between like 12 and almost 30 years to move through a sign, depending on what sign it is. And then you have these outer planet conjunctions that happen, you know, we don't really want to count Jupiter because it's like 12 years. It's kind of too soon, but I'd say like the 19 year cycle, the Saturn Jupiter to the yeah. larger cycles. And basically what she says is that the new Pluto cycle really doesn't happen until you get an outer, one of the other outer planet conjunctions happening. And so once Pluto moves into Aquarius, we see the next outer planet conjunction that's going to happen is going to be Saturn conjunct Neptune in early 2026. So what I'm saying by saying all of that is that <laughs> I think that this is an opportunity as will many of our illuminations and many of the transits over the next three years until we get to that 2026 point in time to really start something new that we've been doing for a really long time, right? And it's just echoing that. And then the Mars and Pluto is really highlighting that it is about Pluto and Mars is about how we take action. Well, and the new moon's also, it's also, um, it's also sextile Neptune. Uh, yes. So, so we have, you know, sextiles on both sides between Mars and Neptune. So we have, in some ways, we have a lot of harmonizing energy, right? It may not, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it fully feels that way, but there is a lot of harmonizing energy. And and especially as with Pluto retrograde and it moves you know, back to Capricorn, there is that sort of cleaning up of old business, right? And so it's interesting how really kind of on this, I don't know, precipice of new, but wait, wait, you didn't quite do this. And so I, I still feel like there's something about this perspective shift. I looked up, did you look up the Sabian symbol for this new moon? I didn't. I, well, I think I did, but I don't. I don't remember what it is. Do you have it in front of you? Yeah, I have my book. I pulled it out just because I tend to be. Sometimes it's. I find it helpful. So with Sabian symbols, we you know we we round up. So if we're at twenty eight degrees, twenty five minutes Taurus, we round up to twenty nine Taurus, and it is two cobblers working at a table. But when I read further down, it talks about how in symbolism the feet are a symbol of understanding. And understanding differs from mere knowledge because it implies at least some degree of identification in depth with what is being understood. And then it says, moreover, it is impossible fully to understand anything except when its opposite is taken into consideration. So this is really having uh, two ways of looking at things in that interplay. And in this case, I was using uh, Dane Ruggiero as an astrological mandala. There's, of course, uh, Mark Edmund Jones' work on Sabian symbols as well. Sure. But this gets back to like a different level of intelligence, I feel as well. I love right? that. Yeah. And um, I love, so I just pulled up my little uh, Sabian symbol saying, you know, same two cobblers working at a table and yeah. it's about working cooperatively, mm -hmm. you know, right? Like with someone of equal skill. Yep. I love that. So, mm -hmm. so how are we going to cooperate on our on or towards value, meaning, and purpose, yep. lining on our value, meaning, and purpose. Like what is important to us as we begin again in reflection of where we have been? Yes. And if you think of this way, Taurus oftentimes is very self-interested. I'm not saying that in any kind of negative way, but it's very interested in, am I going to have enough? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be comfortable? Does this room feel good to me? You know, all those sorts of Taurus things. But with the aspects with, especially in my mind with Pluto, 
and Neptune and the signs of Aquarius and mm-hmm. Pisces, they're making us look at what has value, meaning, and purpose on the greater the greater level, right? For everybody and even beyond just the everybody because Neptune pulls in like literally the multiverse, right? So it's not just about my individual needs or things that make me feel secure, but what do we all need? So I think there's an interplay going on there as well. Yeah. And, you know, I have this HR background and so um, I think a lot about the economy. And when I think about Taurus, I always somehow come back to Karl Marx because that's just how my brain works. (laughs) And, um, and also like that Saturn Neptune conjunction that I mentioned in, um, that's going to happen in Aries. I mean, I'm not going to get like too into it eventually I will, but Mm. the combination of things that's going on in the economy, Pluto is going to be squaring the nodes this summer. We've already seen, seen the economy shift. I do think that there is something about this in terms of people losing their jobs, right? Or like not because of the new moon, I'm not trying to say that, but in the context of what's going on in society, people are currently losing their jobs, people are getting laid off. And um, this whole thing about like, what do we what do we value? And then if you do get laid off, or you're seeing other people get laid off, it's very disturbing. And it does call into question, like, what do I value? And what is mm-hmm. the thing? And what's the purpose of my layoff? What's the purpose of my job? What's the purpose of my life? And am I living it? And so I oh. think it is an invitation, especially for those people who are feeling that Um, especially because of them, their colleagues, their family members to say, you know, how can we collectively work together to get our, our material resource needs met in new ways. And I think it may be the beginning of this very important conversation that should happen on a pretty global scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, But certainly, you know, we live in the United States. You're, you're in the U S right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's like, I don't know. Sometimes I think people are in California. I know. Like, oh, I'm yeah. in Canada, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's a little different. <laughs> They're CAs, but different ones. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that it'll be a really um, powerful and interesting new moon. And the other thing to just note is that so many of our lunations over the past year have had a difficult aspect to Mars, right? And so it's really asking mm-hmm. us uh, to sort of like, rubber meets the road, like do something about how we feel and do something with our energy or vitality and like how we're living and how we're embodying what we eat. And then, you know, not to open this big topic, but like, how are we like acting out in the sense of feeling we need to fight for something or fight against something like clearly in our country? I mean, we only have to turn the news on every day to hear some new violent thing that is happening, right? Or some at least aggressive thing going on. And so I think, you know, that that's part of it too, that if we, if we, I mean, it's healthy to feel like we need to be a champion for something or we need to stand up for something, but how we do it, I think that is a huge piece that we're all being called out on. And so I, and so I think to your point, that's why partly Mars keeps showing up again, 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 again. Yeah. Right are you going to fight or not, you know, and what does that look like? What does fighting look like? What does protection yeah. look like, especially with Mars and cancer? Um, mm-hmm. at that Ooh. Level, right. It's Ooh, like, it is like so defensive. That energy together can be so defensive. Yeah. Uh, what, what do I care about? How do I care for myself? How do I care for others? How do I protect myself? How do I protect my home has been something that's been in the news mm-hmm. and, you know, people using violence to protect their homes. And then also I think another Mars and cancer thing is just the, um, um, the debate about um, what's a good phrase to use. It's not a debate. It's in the Supreme Court. Um, like fertility. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're just trying to be very PC about it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Like, which right. Love- the, the, no, the right to choose like that's yeah. Mars. The Mars is I, I, and in cancer has, you know, is, is, I know it's emotional, but it's a body sign too. And yeah. it's linked and it's, and it's linked with, parenting and nurturing so yeah and when am I going to get mad as hell enough about <clears> something <throat> that like I do something about it and do I have to get mad as hell about it or is there another way because I just I feel yeah. like we're also tired right the new moon is like tired <laughs> in so many ways and we're also tired we don't really have the energy to fight so how do you like take action to get what you need when someone is preventing you from doing the thing which is very like Mars Saturn and Mars Pluto yeah. kind of thing going on um without being violent, like nonviolent action, nonviolent communication that Mars and yeah. retrograde last year was inviting us to, to yeah. think about. 
Well, and, Tor- and Taurus certainly, I mean, wants peace, right? I mean, we can we can say that as an archetype, Taurus wants that. Taurus also, though, is going to be able to put one foot in front of the other. And even if it takes some time, is going to get where it needs to go. But again, I think it comes back to what's worth it. Do you know? I mean, what what is really worth that energy? What is Because a lot of the things, and I can just speak for myself, a lot of the things I get defensive about, and I'm a cancer, so I am quite defensive and I have four planets in cancer. Like it is my, not taking it personally is like my forever million lifetime work plan is how I look at it. Yeah. But most of those things that I get defensive about aren't worth it at all. They don't get me anywhere. They don't improve something and they just drain my energy. So when I look at this, especially with this relationship between Mars and cancer with, you know, the new moon, which means sun and moon, both are in Taurus. Okay. Yeah. But check in. Do, is this where you want to expend the energy? Because we need, I mean, we need our energy for something more important, not just individually, but clearly collectively. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And I think that the invitation when we do feel defensive is to think about vulnerability because it's mm-hmm. easy to fight. It's easy to get angry, right? It's also easy to stuff it down, which yeah. is a whole other thing I won't get into, but like how yeah. we can- <laughs> create sickness in our own bodies by like holding on to our anger when we shouldn't because we don't know how to properly emote and process Mm -hmm. our emotions like energy in motion and then we stop the energy that's in motion and it gets stuck and that causes so many problems but um yeah i think that mars and cancer is like how can we be vulnerable and yes and strengthen vulnerability yeah. And you brought up the health stuff. And this takes us back kind of to how we entered this whole new moon conversation is new relationship with my body, right? New relationship with my body has a lot to do with my mind, you know, mind, body, emotion connection. And if we can find a, a, a more equilibrium in that place, then that spills over into everything we're doing with everyone externally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that, that Mars Pluto opposition is like, if I can, um, you know, let go of the defensiveness and the the urge to fight or the urge to be angry and lean into vulnerability. The Pluto is the empowerment. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can if you can successfully resolve the Mars Pluto opposition, which goes exact the next day on uh, May twentieth, it really is about like feeling empowered and feeling embodied and and saying I am right. Yeah. Mars being connected to Aries, like the yeah. I am, and what you were saying about the values and. Taurus being fixed on the previous sign Mm -hmm. of Aries saying that I am. So I feel like that brings us full circle with that. Yeah. And I mean, and when you, when you defend something and I'm not talking about moments when you actually, I'm not talking about if someone's attacking you somewhere, right? That's not what this part of the conversation is about, but being defensive in general is not a position of power to your point with that Pluto Mars opposition. It's not powerful when you have to defend something, defending something shows there's something to question shows you. So the, the, the strength or the empowerment is in, for example, I am this, right? I don't need to defend it. I am this. I just need to be it. And, and that's, that's, so there is a, there is a, an empowerment in defenselessness. Again, please don't hear that in like a, a tiger is going to eat me kind of you know energy, but I mean, just in general in life, th- that is, there is such an empowerment in just standing strong and nope, this is me. This is where I'm at. I I say this a million times, I think, over and over again, but there was something I listened to John Lennon talking about a long time ago, but he was talking about kind of who cares what you're against, right? What are you for, right? That and that and put your energy into what you're for, not what you're against. And that little tidbit, you know, has really stuck with me for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And so then we have Mars moving into Leo, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like once you've you've d- done that thing of defenselessness, or really, I think defenselessness could be the same thing as vulnerability, right? And yes. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the Tao. You know, I've kind of gotten mm-hmm. back into the Tao recently, and it's mm-hmm. it's like you just go with the flow of life, and so that is part of that, like allowing people to be, mm-hmm. but also saying like you can allow other people to be messy and be mm-hmm. you and hold on to you at the same time, which Taurus does 
ask us to do is a fixed sign, like mm-hmm. to be sort of like fixed in our values. And so if you can do that, then by the time Mars moves into Leo, which Leo is about the heart, it's about courage, and it's about yeah. bravery, right? It's like, you can really see that synthesis into the new sign, but we go from emotion into more like instinct, into more, um, into that fire energy. Yeah. And Leo, well, Mars and Leo to me, I have Mars and Leo. So my my personal experience of it is that its healthiest expression is expressing yourself just from a place that it's just natural and you love it. And it's from the heart, right? It's not attached to anything you receive. It's not attached to, you know, somebody clapping for you. It's just almost the way a child would just jump around and dance just because it feels good to do it. Right. Yeah. To be really playful. It's funny. I have so many folks with Mars and Leo just. Hmm. uh, And it doesn't always. Yeah. And the playfulness, I mean, for some people it comes through and how they're CEO of a company. Right. So it doesn't have to look like a little kid. Right. There's a lots of people with strong Leo that are, you know, they probably wouldn't classify themselves as, you know, playful in that way, but there is at the core of Leo that mm, how do I say it's like the it's like like the the inner essence of like the I don't I want to use the word godlike but I'm not trying to use that in a religious way but just sort of like that inner spirit that is that is completely innocent there's that that place in the inside of Leo yeah and so when when and when it's not too tied up in the external world or how it's trying to look it gets everybody excited because it's just, it's passionate and it's like lit up, right? It's like that light that everybody's like, oh my gosh, look what that person's doing. I want to, it's a person who starts dancing first, right? You know, and then everybody wants to go dance just because it's fun to do it or let's all take selfies, right? And then everybody gets their phone out and takes selfies. I feel like it's that type of energy. It's an invitation to like, just be yourself and let it be seen. Yep. Yeah. It's just, it's, it is similar to that Mars in um, in Aries, but it's more playful. Mm-hmm. It's more just like, this is who I be, right? And mm-hmm. I always love looking at the Mars phase. So I just, um, mm-hmm. it's something you got, have to like look up. So I just looked up the Mars phase because it's about the sign <laughs> of the Mars relationship. And we're in the service phase of Mars. So Mars and the sun met up in Scorpio um, in 2021. And uh, basically the service phase is about actualizing Mm. our dharmic vision within the societal reality. And so this Mars and Leo transit is asking us to be playful, like you said, but also it kind of does echo that what we talked about with that new moon, with the values, meaning and purpose. And like, how can we have fun and how can we do our Dharma in a way that's fun, given the context of society and how things are right now. And just by being ourselves, be natural leaders and making sure that we're aligned with our values and our personal beliefs with, uh, you know, societal ethics and what's going on. Mm. And also just like, again, I think there's something about that letting go of, um, well, just being yourself and then allowing, Mm. being yourself and allowing, like you said before. And um, yeah, just have a good well, time. You mentioned it before that it's it takes it takes courage to just be your authentic self and let it be seen. It does because, because it takes and it takes a lot of heart and courage because not everyone's going to like it and that's okay, right? Yeah. But usually, at least from the in the Leo moment, it doesn't particularly feel okay while it's happening. When you were talking about the service phase. It makes sense because when Mars was in Cancer, Cancer, you know, is a yin sign. So it is more about going inside and kind of feeling out. And it, this, that's perfectly aligned with now as it comes out to Leo, right? All the things that I've sort of sussed out or felt around or kind of reconnected with on the inside of myself now becomes ready to like come out and be shared or expressed. And I think that's a beautiful way of thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think it's wonderful because we, we kind of talked about the Mars Pluto thing, but then sun moves into Gemini on May 21st. Yeah. Early in the morning. And so I'll just share my screen so folks can see it. It's not to the, not to the minute, but um, we've got here, the sun at zero degrees, 20 minutes. So just 20 minutes after them uh, and not 20 actual minutes, but just 
<laughs> 20 like astrological minutes after uh, the sun moves into Gemini. So you have a pretty good idea of what it looks like, at, at least in terms of the aspects. And so again, mm -hmm. you know, the sun hasn't moved that far, just two degrees from the new moon. So we still see that same T square and um, that aspect there. So um, yeah, I think that that then invites us to have conversation. Yeah. Right? It allows us to shed light on the information that's important for us to consider with the sun in Gemini. And maybe around that time is where, you know, individually or collectively, we get new information, right? Or new things pop in. Sometimes I think about Taurus being the time you sort of cultivate the space, right? I don't know. You're, you're ready to receive because Taurus is very linked with receptivity. But then here comes Gemini and all of a sudden, oh, here's the information, but maybe now I'm re ready to receive it. Mm -hmm. Maybe now, I, I, maybe to your, to your point before about like the, the ending something and beginning something, kind of those things coming together. Maybe I have shifted my relationship and I have this new relationship with what's been going on. And now I get that last little bit that I'm like, oh my gosh, it makes sense. And I can put it all together. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, and that'll be, that'll be really helpful for us because I think having these conversations is important. And, and I think with the moon moving through Gemini, you know, um, for those two days after the new moon in Taurus and then the sun moving into Gemini, I think it's going to trigger that whole, you know, Mars um, retrograde that we had in Gemini last year, especially because the sun and moon are making aspects to Mars and they're making helpful aspects. And so we may be revisiting some things from last fall and early this year um, that kind of echo that transit. And then uh, we do see the sun sextile Mars on uh, the 22nd and oh. Uh, and before that, the sun makes its uh, exact trine to Pluto, which we've talked about um, already. But then on the 23rd, we see Mars making a sort of cross purposes, challenging aspect uh, square to Jupiter. So that sort of mm. makes things a little bigger. It kind of doesn't allow us to ignore what's going on, certainly. No, Jupiter's like the giant flashlight for better or for worse. It is the truth revealer of what's going on. I know we think of it as being a benefic and I don't disagree, you know, with that in general, but I do feel more than anything it it expands the view of whatever is there, which, you know, which is super useful, but sometimes un uncomfortable, which is why I sometimes say Jupiter transits, you know, things or aspects in the chart aren't always easy, right? Even though they can bring flow because oftentimes it's the truth we have to get to first. So in this case, you know, what's the truth around that Mars and Leo energy that we need to see? Mm, yeah. Love that. And I think on a practical level, um, just going back to my example of layoffs, this is when people like when the layoffs happened and like, this is when you go back to the office and you suddenly have two to four times as much work as you normally did because those people are not in the office and they didn't transition because why would they, <laughs> why would they leave you a manual of how they did their job? Um, and I don't even mean that sarcastically. Like, I mean, yeah, no, they let you <laughs> if yeah. the company fires you, you shouldn't be doing stuff like that. So um, people are going to, because I think that I see that Mars Jupiter is like hard work um, mm -hmm. and work expanding certainly in a way that's uncomfortable for people. And I think another way to think about that too, um, when you just think about the difference between, like if there's a challenge between Taurus and Leo in general, right? What what tends to be, you know, the struggle or the push and pull between the two? You know, it's interesting, even if we just think a simple money example, right? Like Leo kind of likes to buy what it wants, right? And Taurus is like, <laughs> yeah, and, right? And so- I mean, we know Taurus can hoard and collect things too, but in general, Taurus is going to be more likely to really check in and say, you know, do we really need that or is it a good value? Um, and so I just think it, it's interesting too, kind of looking at that back and forth. And we were talking about fixed signs, of course, Taurus and Leo, both fixed signs. So they both, both want value, meaning and purpose, but in slightly different ways. And so when you put people's strong values squaring off with each other, and by the way, this reflects all of us collectively, can be very interesting. I, I almost wonder if it's, if, and maybe I'm simplifying too much. You can, you know, of course, you know, take over with your own opinion, but if Taurus is essential needs and if Leo in many ways is kind of just what my heart wants, there's a lot of different ways that that, that can go, right? Meaning, do we go too far and ask for too much, right? Or do we get kind of too inflated with ourselves or 
how, or do we stay too small and too shut in an old place of safety? Right. So that's kind of the interplay. At least I'm, I'm feeling into the two. Yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly, 100%. One of the major themes for this year that I've seen in this aspect and other things going on, like the nodes changing signs, being ruled by uh, Mars and Venus and so many things. And if folks are interested, you can check out my year ahead forecast Mm -hmm. um, and some of the other conversations. Like I had a conversation with Louise Eddington about Venus and uh, with Sam Reynolds about Venus and Mars. Talk a lot about how... I think that one of the major things for this year that's coming up with these planets is executive compensation. And I think that is what you said, you know, it's like, am I spending too much? Am I not spending enough? Like how much money is what, what is a good investment? What is not? And I was just reading this morning and I think it was, I don't want to call it the brand the wrong way. I think it was like Miller Knoll or Miller something like that. Mm -hmm. It's two part name. And it sounded to me like Miller Lite, <laughs> beer company, but I, I actually don't know what the company is. And there was a, a CEO, female CEO, and she got on a Zoom a couple weeks ago, I think. And she basically uh, yelled at all of her employees about how they need to stop talking about how they didn't get bonuses and didn't get a raise, or they got a 17 cent or 25 cent raise. And she's walking away with a at least million, if not multi-million dollar bonus on top of her million or multi-million dollar salary. And I'm sure she has like many CEOs stock options that are the actual compensation that they're getting because the stock options are oftentimes worth 10 to maybe a hundred times more than their compensation and their bonus. And someone did the math on what she and the other three or so um, executive, like C-level executives got. It was, I want to say between five and 10 million total in bonuses alone. And if they divided that by 11,000 employees, the 11,000 employees, regardless of if they were on a performance improvement plan or they were seller employees, Mm -hmm. Would have each gotten about three hundred and twenty-five dollars or something like that in a bonus. Which, if you're making, you know, hourly pay, um, you know, it's nice to get like three hundred or two hundred dollars or something like that. It certainly doesn't, um, you know, it's probably it's not what they deserve. It's they deserve much more than that. Uh, But it just goes to show, like Leo, and I'm saying this because Leo is like the king, right? And we could say that a CEO would be like a king in today's time and then Taurus is that value and that money and it can be very simple and very basic Mm -hmm. and so if you're talking about someone who's hourly pay you might like kind of conflate the two there and then in the square aspect it's like coming to um, a place where they're both uncomfortable the CEO is uncomfortable because they're like I don't want to spend money on you and the Mm -hmm. person who's the employee is very uncomfortable because they're not getting their resource needs met and they don't feel like um, the CEO is aligning with their values either oh and that I, I could come up with several personal examples, not just myself, but people in my life who are dealing with very, very similar things. So I think it's a that value then becomes even how do we value other people? What work do we value, right? All, all across the board. And I, as you were talking about it, this also has so much to do with Pluto and Aquarius, right? And but of course it's going to go. It's you know it's going to go back to Capricorn. So there is this back and forth between. Is the money staying at the top Capricorn or is it going to get distributed out? And in the meantime, you know, I think there's a lot of struggle between that. And it's interesting. To, it'll be interesting to see, even like in my, my personal examples, I can see where like the top has stretched a little bit to give a little bit more, right? Sometimes though, they don't at all. And then you watch the fallout, right? You watch people leave, you watch there being no one to do the work, or to your point, you watch the people who are left struggling to do three jobs at the same time, which puts us in a new situation, which is now how much do I value myself? Am I going to stay? Well, that's in, in Taurus. My progress moon's in Taurus right now, but think about 26 degrees. So there is a real legitimate, Taylor, you know this, fear of well, okay, maybe if I, and I'm not describing my job right now, so please don't, I'm just in general, (laughs) it's like, don't hear it that way. But in general of this, am I worth more? Is this, is this something that I should or should not allow to continue? Right. And so, and everyone needs to make that decision for themselves. But with Taurus, it's very scary to think that you might not have a paycheck, right? You might not have enough. 
And then I think then on the positive side of Leo, though, there's a bit of a standing up for myself in the Tarot, the uh, Mars and Leo card is valor, right? It's bravery. I mean, it's standing up and literally it's like holding all the seven wands back to, you know, like to protect yourself because there is a certain sense of I do deserve more. But again, where's the balance? So mm -hmm. we have it going on at the at the micro level and the macro level. And yeah. and it's likely to come out in some pretty extreme ways at different times. Absolutely. And I, I'm really curious to see, you know, we've got the eclipse that's going to happen before this, like the moon yes. is the eclipse and we're recording before then. So we don't know what's happening, but um, I certainly think that that eclipse and then the, the nodes moving into Aries and Libra yep. is about at plus with Pluto and Aquarius, the story really is, are we going to have the courage and bravery to come together in unions to come yep. together and stand up for ourselves to, um, you know, to protest and to do what we need to do to say collectively Pluto and Aquarius, yeah. we have so much more power than one executive CEO, but we're conditioned in this Pluto Capricorn way to like, just like give all our power away to like some figurehead in authority, like, because we think we're supposed to or traditional because when we were in school, they kind of beat us out of it. They were like, let's mm -hmm. just have standardized tests and this and yep. yeah, all that ingenuity. And then I think on, May 24th, when Venus squares Chiron, that is another Ooh. echo of this, where we say, what are my values, Venus? And then mm -hmm. the pain is coming in with Chiron, that wound, that wounded healer Chiron is like, I've got to heal the pain that I'm feeling that is coming to where I'm at odds with my values right now. And also my relationships, Venus, with other people. Right. And on the same uh, or two days later, then Venus comes to sextile Uranus, where it's like you get an opportunity for um, a change or an idea that comes through, maybe through your relationships and other people or because you felt this pain and, and your values. And you get to say, like, oh, light bulb moment, like something random happens or you take a chance and you say mm -hmm. say what you need to say or or link up with the people you need to link up with to really say all right, let's do some stuff. Let's make some moves. Yeah. In a helpful yeah. way. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot here. It sounds simple. We probably re have reset it 10 times, but back to the new moon, which kind of led us into all this talk, getting into that, getting clear, right? Not just getting clear in your head, but feeling in every fiber of your body to the extent that you can now, because things change, we change, right? But getting a feel of this is me. This is where I'm at. This is what I really want. This is what I really value. Because the more that you can like hold into that space, no matter what is kind of going on around, it's like a compass all the way that you move through these different transits coming forward. But with Taurus, it's never enough just to like think it. You have to embody it, right? And that's a whole different animal than just, you know, I don't have, I have a South node in Gemini. So, oh, I get it. We're talking about it. You say something. I'm like, oh yeah, right. And then I'll be like, I can't live that. Do you know what I mean? Or like, I'm not, or like, I'm not, you know, there's a difference between even when I look at my birth chart and I can look at all the possibilities and things, a lot of it, I can't live it yet. Taurus is in many ways about what, where are you at and what can you actually live now? So even choosing less, which I know we talked about, Taurus does have a tendency sometimes to overaccumulate things, but but really minimalist and quality over quantity is at the heart of Taurus. So choosing less and being able to fully do it and fully be present and fully hold your space is worth more than trying to do 50 million things that you can't really hold your own on. Ooh, that is so important. And, uh, you know, I personally am feeling sun square Jupiter right now, <laughs> <laughs> like Jupiter squaring my natal sun and it's a natal excitation because I have it natally. <laughs> all about like spreading myself too thin and saying yes to too many things and not being simple. So I'm going to yeah. take that lesson for me through this lunation for sure. And I think it's interesting. So then the same day, like uh, May 26th, we have Mars square the nose, which we talked about a little bit before, but I just want to call out that's when we'll feel that energy kind of heighten is, and that is about, you know, the whole story with the new moon, but also like now we're finally being asked to make a decision about how we want to move forward. And then the next day on May 27th, we have this first quarter moon at six degrees of Virgo, which is interesting for so many reasons, because we had that new moon at 28 degrees. So the first quarter moon is an out of sign. Um, mm. It's not. So you have a Taurus Virgo, which is going to be a trine, right? It's not going to be a square. 
aspect um, that you might expect. And what you get is a Gemini sun Virgo moon combination. And what I find in when I've done research on the on people who are prominent who have Virgo Gemini placements is that they are um, they're very Virgo. So that doesn't make any sense to people who don't understand what I mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, they they pass information on to children. So like Virgo is the teacher and Gemini is oh. the child. And hmm. Gemini is often about learning and Virgo is about subject matter expertise. And so they're often people who have a verbal tradition, which can you can think of that as pretty Mercury, but it's also moon. Like the moon is yeah. how we communicate and transfer yeah. information. So to have the moon in Virgo means I'm taking my subject matter expertise that comes from Virgo and I'm using my moon in Virgo to transfer that information verbally. And oftentimes it is um, singers. So um, Enrique Iglesias's father, I believe had this, and then he passed his musical talents onto his son. And then there's another one, um, Van Morrison passed his um, musical verbal, right? Mm. Knowledge onto his daughter. So these are people who have Virgo Gemini. So that might be something, but it's, it's interesting for another reason, which is that I think that the three earth signs, Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn, when you put them together, it's really hard work. So, and this first quarter moon is often about like putting out fires and like just being asked to do too much. So again, that energy of like, I'm taking on three jobs or everyone's coming at me and asking me for too much um, is kind of the feel. And then to your point, on the 28th, the sun squares Saturn, and that is when we're asked to be really simple and pare it down, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When you're talking about the first quarter moon, the phase, first quarter phase in general, one of the things that we, uh, key little phrases we use for it is crisis in action, right? Because the tendency is, right, we have to like step out and do it and we actually learn from the results. So to your point, sometimes we take on too much or we go too far, but it's hard to know without testing it. So another thing to think about during that first quarter moon is sometimes you will need to try something. Right. And, and, and it's not about worrying so much about how it turns out. It's about you need to see it play out in real time versus just keeping, you know, this is past way past the new moon seed point. It's to the point where we need to get an idea of what's shaping up, but it's not full yet. So, yes. you know, and that echoes the Mars and Leo that we we're talking about. And it yeah. also echoes something I've been talking about a lot, which during the eclipses, there are a lot of folks who were feeling very inspired. It was the first new moon, the, the first eclipse is the first new moon after Pluto moved into Aquarius. Mm-hmm. So it was the like kind of a new beginning. Yeah. People were like, oh, I should do stuff. But there's some astrologers who say like, I shouldn't do anything new. And it's like, if if you did something new, this is where you have that learning, right? Where like maybe yeah. it didn't work out and you kind of take the next step. And if you didn't do it, you're like, why didn't I do it? It's time to go yeah. do it. Taylor, I don't know what you say about this. I do like my... When there's eclipses, for example, I do advise that, you know, you wait a couple of days at least before you set intentions or do like any kind of moon type of manifestation magic work. But I also always tell people that like Mercury retrograde, good advice is not to sign contracts, but I also say you ought to have to live your life. And so ultimately, you know, your intuition, your gut is your number one compass. And so I know that as astrologers, we kind of get stuck, me too, and well, here's how we do it. Here's how it should be. But to your point, if you know there's something in you you need to do, part of the energy that's going on right now is about giving yourself permission to trust that. I mean, this comes back to the beginning, trust that animal <laughs> intelligence that you have inside of you. Even if a million astrologers tell you something different, that don't let that override you. Exactly. And you will know, you know, and I think for me, it's more if there's a lunar eclipse, I would say just be careful because I wouldn't want to imprint that emotional <laughs> thing on myself yes. but i feel like a north node solar eclipse is a power surge and that's what we had and that is a time to like really go with the flow yeah. if it's a south node solar eclipse like you probably just won't feel the energy yeah. you, you probably just won't you know i mean you might and then go with it but so mm-hmm. i think you really have to think about what planet is on what node Mm-hmm. and what sign is it in and there's just a lot and this whole thing in Aries was like just a ton of solar yeah. energy that um didn't seem so bad and uh no yeah so yeah I mean just go with your gut and also I think the problem is that so many of us 
hold on to this, like, I'm going to start something new and this will be the thing forever. And the doubt is like, go with the flow. And like, (laughs) like, so if you know that life is about nothing ever lasts forever, then there's no problem. But if some part of you is very fixed and says, Mm -hmm. this has to last and work, well, then you're, you've got a life philosophy problem. <laughs> you know? Well, <laughs> I'm reading uh, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti is one of my one of my favorites. And I'm reading what, most of his books are very small, which I appreciate too. But the one I'm reading now is happy is the one who is nothing, right? Which is a which is a whole right again, that doesn't mean you're not doing something. But to your point, I feel like that isn't that sort of, sort of same stream of philosophy around letting go and having spaciousness. Yeah. Which, by the way, is very Neptune and Pisces right now, right? Get having some spaciousness around things. Totally. And it reminds me of something my mom has said my whole life, which is that ignorance is bliss. Like, if you didn't <laughs> know if this were happening and you started a new company, you would never know. So just go do it. Like, ignorance is bliss. Happiness is having nothing. They're very similar mm. phrases, right? Yeah. And so we end this, um, this new moon cycle uh, with, Jupiter meeting up with the North Node yeah. in early degrees of Taurus on June first. I I mean I don't know what how you feel, but how I feel that in some ways that just magnifies that brings us, I guess, to the big the big expansion point of all the things we talked about at the new moon in Taurus. It's almost like we 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 open the door and then here comes okay now there's real possibility. What can we really do with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm really excited. I mean, Jupiter's, we call it the greater benefic. Um, Jupiter's not always easy because it can be too much of a good thing. Like I said, I the Jupiter square the sun and it's good, but it's also like saying yes to too many things yeah. and you get spread too thin. But now Jupiter and Jupiter's been conjunct Chiron and kind of like yeah. expanded our wound and all of that. But now Jupiter is in Taurus. It's in a new sign. And um, it's almost like expanding our need to slow down and yeah. um expanding our learning and teaching and asking questions about what do we value and uh, Mm -hmm. what gives us meaning and what gives us purpose in the future. And so again, kind of coming full circle to that new moon um, where we're talking about how we're moving back into Pluto with Capricorn. And then um, we're waiting, not waiting, but like we we're preparing, we're cultivating the ground now and over the next couple of years for that Saturn Neptune conjunction with Pluto and Aquarius. And I really do think the story is about people communing, coming to work together collectively. Mm-hmm. And this Jupiter conjunct the North Node in Taurus is an opportunity for us to really consider and think about um, you know, where we're going in the future. Because when you have so a planet conjunct the North Node, one of the ways of looking at it is we've never done this before. So what's new for us? And so we get to consider it, all of these questions in a new way. How do we want to do it going forward? Yeah. And Taurus is a lot about simplifying, right? South Node and Scorpio, complicated, tension, overwhelm, you know, all the drama. I mean, there's other really positive things in there too, but just as an example to kind of juxtapose the two. And then Taurus is really simplify, right? What, what, what do I, what, do I really need to do now? And I, my I, my favorite thing to think about with Taurus oftentimes is that idea of going back to grazing as well, right? Mm-hmm. Which doesn't mean that there's not things to do, but you think about animals, right? Animals in nature, when something comes to attack them or something gets them upset, right? Of course, they get into their frenzy for a minute, but then they shake it off, right? They're, they shake their bodies off and they go back and they do what they need to do. Yeah. In many ways, I, from my perspective, many of us are stuck and kind of some perpetual trauma that is kind of continuing to create and stir up new things. I'm not saying this to minimize trauma at all, but there is with Taurus this ability to in some ways find a way to get a new grounded place that allows us to kind of step out of that constant, constant stimulated place of things being so worked up. So this is in part you know, getting out, like if you want to think of Scorpio as swimming around with the alligators, this is where you, you know, you get out and you get on the, on the dry land and, you know, you, you get your feet underneath you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like that. And it reminds me of two things. One is super random, but when you said grazing, I was like, oh, charcuterie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy that too. So, that's right. Like just all of us coming together and just grazing all day and like, yeah 
And, you know, I think we might see more of those memes about like, just eat grapes and like, live <laughs> life and, like love it. Right. Like that's what we should. Yeah. Be. But also, um, and this is like a huge topic, so I won't get into it, but I do just want to acknowledge mm-hmm. the fact that so many of the people who are alive today have a number of outer planets in Scorpio. And so the South node yeah. going to those planets um, has been an invitation for us to let go of what has been dogmatic or what has mm-hmm. you know, been not helpful for us and then reclaim it reclaim those planets in a new way or reassess how our generation wants to embody those energies. So Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, obviously Saturn and Jupiter um, is more common. And um, so I think that Jupiter meeting up with the North Node at these early degrees is an invitation. And it's sort of like a preview of how when Jupiter comes to oppose all of those outer planets in all of our generations, how are we being challenged by new teachers and new information and new philosophies to really change or embody and rewrite our stories and the legacy that we want to leave for future generations since they are a generational planet. So Jupiter will oppose the Pluto, Jupiter will oppose people's Neptunes, Jupiter will oppose people's Uranus. Um, and it'll just be a really interesting thing to see like how the North Node did it like going backwards and now how Jupiter is going to do it Mm. moving forwards. Mm. Yeah. So thank you so much, Tara, for joining Mm -hmm. me. This has been an amazing conversation and I hope to have you back and we can do more. And we were just throwing ideas around of like, can we talk about the moon and then talk about like how the moon phase related to the planet to your, you know, the work that you've done in your book astrology by moonlight. Um, if we could do a, um, a, a horoscope, you know, a, a, a forecast like that. So folks, let us know if you would be interested in that because it's a lot of work. So <laughs> <don't think> yeah, <laughs> but no, but I would love it. And we, and really it's yeah. just looking at the moon, moon in phase relationship with other planets, right? We, most of us are used to moon phases, moon sun, but you can look at the moon with any other planet and it really does reveal some pretty cool information. But yeah. Taylor, thanks for having me. I, well, you know, you know, I love you. So it's been a pleasure to be I here. Know, likewise, yeah. is there anything that um, you want to share with people? Like remind folks again, where they can find you or what you have coming up soon? Yeah. I mean, in general, what's going on uh, at Sage Goddess, I'm teaching a class called Living Astrology. That's part of a, a, a bigger program. And if you're interested in that, you can go to sagegoddess.com slash living magic. And my website, again, is just my name, Tara All, T-A-R-A-A-A-L.com. My my biggest, my favorite jam that's been, I've been doing since 2015 is Living Planets First, which is a whole other conversation. But so that that is where you choose a planet uh, for a period of time and let that kind of be the filter through which like yourself and life comes through. And so I have stuff uh, like that's on my website and yeah, but that's that's me right now. Thank you so yeah. much. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the forecast. Let us know what you think in the comments and we will see you again next time. Take good care. Bye now.